I wanted to open it. Sorry about that cage. That's okay. Totally okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to open with a poem today because um, that's largely how I've approached my work, largely how I really entered uh, into making art and healing through art for sexual violence. Um, that poem called Magic Trick uh, was part of an, the intro to a project that I'll share with you about today. Um, and I'm just gonna throw up my slideshow for you all. So my face the entire time that I present. <laughs> One sec. All right, just want to make sure that folks can actually see everything. It appears that we're on. Um, got a little photo of doing, doing my poetry thing. Um, as I've said, yeah, that's been mostly what I've gravitated to in this work. Um, I have recited that poem a few times now um, in person and it's now a pleasure to do it again for you guys. Um, what I'll be presenting on today, I am kind of calling my talk, this is healing from sexual violence through catharsis and recreation in art. Um, catharsis and recreation have been two of like the biggest tools or themes in my art that I've used to help my own healing. Uh, the photo on, on the right there is from uh, an exhibit that I will share a little bit about later in this presentation. Just wanna introduce myself really briefly for you all. Um, I use they, them pronouns. My name is Cage. I'm a survivor. I have been an advocate as well. Um, I was an inter intern and advocate at SARSM in 2015. I've facilitated some support groups for survivors starting back in 2014. I co-facilitated uh, the first sexual violence support group on my campus at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Human Ecology from that school. Uh, I've been a speaker for Portland's annual Slut Walk back in 2017, I was asked to speak at that, uh, just to give some, some relevance of why, why I'm here today, why I was asked to speak. Um, I've also been involved with New Fruit, sort of a DIY art practice space, an art collective based on radical values in, in Portland. Um, most recently, I've collaborated with other survivors uh, who were invited to create a pilot program uh, for, for basically addressing sexual violence and for survivors to use at the Restorative Justice Institute of Maine. Um, more recently, um, I'm gravitating toward uh, becoming, I'm in the process of becoming a, an end of life doula, a death doula through INELDA, which is the International End of Life Doula Association. Um, art that I like to explore. I have really gravitated toward poetry. I've done a little bit of slam, like performance poetry, collage, photography, um, as well as, yeah, um, screen printing, interactive art installations. I really, really love anything interactive with people. Um, performance art, some documentary video, a little bit of uh, audio projects. And I'm just now starting to enter the world of making music, which has been by far the most intimidating for me. Um, in a world where I don't, that feels harder, harder to enter for me, um, but I'm, I'm challenging myself this year. Um, why heal through art? Um, Want to talk about like why, yeah, why art? Why is this so important to this work? Why is it so integral? I really feel that our own expression as survivors especially is the only thing that we have any control over. And I really wanna emphasize that because we have all these systems that are in place that really, they don't serve us. They often work against us. Um, you know, like in the event that somebody does try to use our justice system, uh, it often doesn't even work even if they want to be using it. And most of us, most survivors don't uh, even want to. Um, so I, I think it's really important to 
really sit with what do we have control over? What can survivors do? What avenues actually lead them somewhere that's going to provide some sense of justice or healing? And I think that's really where um, I think art is essential. I think it's vital to being, it is the only thing that we have control over in our healing is our expression. I wanted to go over and touch on some, some resources um, that are sort of mainstream and offered right now. Um, it's something that you know, I take away from my own experience as being an advocate in 2015, that the mainstream resources I have sort of listed on the left here of you know, assisting with reporting to police or navigating court, um, accompaniment to the hospital, therapy referrals, support groups, those things are great and essential. I don't want to knock on those, those resources, but I would say they're very reactionary. I would say they're what follows the immediate aftermath of uh, sexual violence. And I would say that they are once again, depending on those systems. So I wanna challenge us to think about ways that survivors don't have to do that and can actually empower themselves. So I have on the right resources that, you know, that truly facilitated and supported my own healing um, looks very different. Um, making art movement was essential and yoga, meditation, um, activism and meeting other survivors was critical, support groups, therapy, definitely. Um, but more than anything, gravitating toward the art and the connection that that made with other people was largely instrumental uh, in my healing. Um, and I, like so many others, I, ha I have a similar story of, I. there was a point where I, I tried to navigate using the system and I was flat out told that it wasn't worth doing. Um, so I just think it's important to, to keep that in mind. Let's give tools that people have. This is like art is accessible. I know it maybe sounds scary to some people, but um, it's, it's more accessible and achievable than a lot of the other options we have. Um, a couple photos I just wanna share with you all um, because my healing really began, uh, you know, after the first assault I ever experienced, I was raped at my college. I really became involved in activism and took place in solidarity actions that we held. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of Emma, Emma Sulkowitz who did the carry the weight sort of art project. She carried her mattress around the campus as a, like, we can't, I can't put this down. This happened to me. This is something I live with every day. I have, I want you all to see it. And, you know, people should have to like be accountable for something like this. This is a, this is a huge problem. Um, so here we, we did this on my campus for a week straight at lunch. We would have folks uh, come out and help us carry the mattresses around campus. We would invite them to do so and just be a part of this like living, breathing, this felt like a living, breathing art piece um, because activism can really, can really work that way. Um, it definitely felt, felt that way for me. Um, just another example here of just being involved um, and how empowering that really was as a turning point for me. Um, this was at the, the start of our lovely Trump presidency um, at, the, at the Capitol in Maine. Out, out there holding my signs, <laughs> giving my two cents. Um, I wanna really talk about uh, part of what Canyon touched on in the beginning um, introduction that uh, I'm sure a lot of people have this sentiment, but I'm not an artist. I don't know how to make art. I'm not good at art. I I've said those things. I've heard everybody say those things, <laughs> even artists that are like, you are, you are clearly an artist. Uh, I don't think of myself as one. Um, I honestly think of myself more as I'd maybe say I'm a writer. Um, I don't make art to end up in an art gallery. And I think that's also the really important thing to think about here with trying to engage survivors in art. Um, it's more about the process. It's not about the product. This isn't a this isn't like a capitalist end goal of here, here's this thing. Um, it's really about the process. It's about engaging in it for our healing, right? Um, and I think engaging with creativity is, is it's a fundamental tool in maintaining our well being. It should, it should be in our toolbox. Um, I think the easiest way I like to imagine art or the purpose of art, um, I have a friend that talks about this as art being 
it's a it's like a vessel or think of it as a container for emotions that we externalize it's a way to get those emotions outside of ourselves um and depending on the emotions a survivor might be experiencing in their process the art forms could look very different um they you know might need something entirely different from other survivors depending on where they're at but the beautiful thing about art is it's I think it should be used as an intuitive process. It's that way it's something that ends up reinforcing the survivor's autonomy and intuition and their own personal empowerment. Um, it's not something that yet another thing is just being like shoved down their throats that they don't really have like control over. Um, it ends up being like an empowerment process and something that will like continue to guide them. Um, tapping into that intuition is so important, instrumental in healing. Um, I just have a few quick reflection questions for you all. Um, if you just wanna take a minute, two minutes, just to think about these, maybe jot something down if something comes to mind for you, or, or at least hold some things in your mind, mull it over. What, what are your emotional outlets? What are your expressive or creative outlets? Do you, do you gravitate? Do you depend on certain activities like physical exercise or therapy as your release or like coping skill? is art a part of your life? How much of it is a part of your life? Do you engage with creativity? You know, um, how much is that a part of your life? Is that something you only did as a, ki as a kid? Um, I think it's worth thinking about. And I like having people think about this because I'm a big fan um, of the idea that, you know, we should be practicing this ourselves if we're inviting or encouraging others to do it. Um, phys like physicians pres prescribing something to somebody and never having tried it. I don't really like that. <laughs> I don't really trust that. Um, I think it's like, this is life skills that we all need, right? Um, just me thinking about, yeah, how much do you engage in creativity in your own life? And hold, hold that in there somewhere to reflect on. I want to talk a little bit about um, assessing a survivor's needs because it's like, okay, great, um, art, it's important, I understand, but how do we figure out what somebody might be needing? And I think it really fundamentally goes back to asking a survivor about what, what are they experiencing, what are their emotions, what are they stuck in, struggling with, what can't they move past, what do they feel like they need to let out, what, what, what is what part of their process are they, are they in and determining from there um, what resources they might need. And that could look like, you know, a few different ways I have here listed are just asking a survivor to write about their feelings, maybe providing a writing prompt, um, getting them to really chew on that a little bit and externalize a little. Um, it might look like asking a survivor to do like a meditation um, to be able to actually even get in their body and embody their emotions to be curious about what comes up. Um, so often, right, we're like, us survivors are like, you know, it's, it's hard to be in the body all the time. Um, we might not even know what we're feeling. We're astral projecting sometimes. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, crucial to be able to like sit with what you're feeling a little bit to be able to explore that. Some possible examples, I wanna reiterate, this could look you know, very different survivor to survivor, but for me, I'm offering from, from my own experience that you know, I have emotions or experiences kind of lift, listed over here on the left, and then what I might be doing to try to navigate those or try to have some, some form of healing. When I was super overwhelmed or anxious, I really gravitated toward like needing movement. I needed to meditate or do yoga or, I needed to like affirm myself. I needed to write like a love letter. I needed to write affirmations. Um, imagining writing to like my child self has been incredibly helpful. Um, Cause you know, I think we're a lot harder on ourselves, less compassionate than we are with others, you know, kind of like othering yourself like that um, is a really good cre creative exercise to do. Um, very grounding for me. Sadness, depression, hopelessness, and grief. Um, yeah, the grief really, really pushed me into my, into my writing. Poetry It was a way to expel that and sort of in a, in a private, uh, thoughtful, quiet way. Photographs, painting, those are other ways. Hurt, anger, and betrayal, frustration. 
Uh, I found myself wanting to take things apart, uh, literally creating and destroying things, taking things apart, re remaking them, collage, doing release rituals of sorts, burning things, uh, writing do not send letters. That was a big one, um, only introduced to me a couple years ago. And that was a game changer. You really just don't hold back. If you're not sen sending those words, you can just let it all out. Um, isolation and loneliness and hopelessness. You know, I gravitated towards support groups and being involved in something like larger than myself. Um, activism, self-doubt and self-destructive behavior and apathy. You know, I, I definitely needed therapy and affirmations for this. I, I would either write or even record my own voice, do, you know, doing affirmations um, to sort of aid in my own healing. Hey Kate, and, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Folks are wondering if you'll be able to share the slides after, because it it might depend on how many notes they take. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we can we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, seeking peace, it, it might you know I think that's a huge reason for art too. Maybe you just want to um, maybe like a, a little escape from that experience. It's hard to sit with all the time, and so I think. Art also provides this meditative space of just like really losing yourself in something. And that can look, you know, like so many different art forms, painting, drawing, where it's very connected, tangible in your hand, like constant um, sculpting, ceramics. It might look like dance, more movement, um, embroidery, something very just like meditative repetition, a process involved. Um, something very, very calming and peace, peace giving about that. And this is just a, just a small example of a poem. Like I started so small when I started to write about uh, the aftermath of like my own experiences with sexual violence. On um, the days you can only breathe. Happiness is the color of sunshine on the inside of your eyelids. Um, hours of meditating and just thinking about that. Um, just as a brief example. Um, and even, even this year, I've had to pull these tools out of my toolbox. Um, it's been a really, 2020 has been a, a terribly challenging year for, for everyone. And this is something I ended up doing as an exercise that uh, I now just call it an art piece. I took my calendar that just hangs on my refrigerator and I said, yeah, this isn't even a calendar anymore. Screw this. And it's just covered in one giant affirmation. Um, of what I needed to affirm for myself going forward into this year and taking care of myself, prioritizing myself and my healing going forward, because um, it's constant. Um, so just an idea, this, this could be something that you do. Um, I now just have it hanging up like it's art, because <laughs> it is. Um, art as an invitation, I just wanna touch on this idea really quick. And then after this slide, I'll be, I'll be getting into some example, some of my my work as examples that you might be able to implement with su survivors or encourage them to try on their own. Um, but this idea of art as an invitation, um, I want to talk about. I think that art, like vulnerability and our sharing, opening up, you know, space for others to be vulnerable is is so important. Brene Brown talks about this. If you all haven't ever heard Brene Brown, uh, there's a link to the Power of Vulnerability TED Talk she gave. Um, and she's coming out with a new book with Tarana Burke soon, which sounds like it's going to be fantastic. Um, I think this is a huge part of, of this work though. And for me, um, being an advocate and there being a non-disclosure rule um, was a bit of a barrier for me against tapping into such a, like our strongest connection. Uh, and I just want to encourage you all to mull it over and think about what ways does that does that affect your work with survivors? Um, does it inhibit you? Does it? How does it play into that and affect um, our ability to, to help survivors and you know provide those resources that maybe they need? Um, and that's not to say, of course, disclosing is not ever essential or required of us. But I do think that it's it's just it's true that expressing our own experiences and vulnerability builds connection. It creates the conditions that are necessary for healing to happen, that trust um, that has been true for me. Um, and I mentioned this because in most of the art projects I've done, if they involve other people, 
I always offer it with a giving, a sharing first of myself and my own experience, because I don't, I don't think that, I don't think these art pieces would work if I myself wasn't giving and creating that space for trust, for healing to happen. Um, the greatest therapist I had to this day was someone who also shared. Um, I just think that's really great proof for me as someone, um, I can say I'm, I'm a stubborn person. I'm stubborn as heck. And after experiencing trauma, um, I wouldn't have trusted anybody that didn't tell me that they were also a survivor if I was looking to them for help or advice um, because of how many people, um, the, the backlash I faced or not believing me or additional trauma on top of that from people not understanding. So I just want to like voice that as maybe something to be considering here going forward um, in this kind of work. Uh, the first, first body of work that I'm going to share with you, um, this was really big for me in 2017. I created this piece of work. It's uh, essentially an anthology. I called it the Survivor Manifesto. Uh, it has been adapted. It's been used by AMHC in Hancock County as a resource for survivors and support groups before. Um, I know that was used a couple of years ago and received some feedback that it was it was helpful for some survivors to have this as like testimony and, you know, think about their own experiences in that sort of a mirrored lens. Um, the Survivor Manifesto is, um, it's an anthology. I ended up inviting uh, only people that I knew personally who had disclosed to me to participate in this project. And I think that's that's a really big part of it that I want to emphasize is I didn't just cast this as like an open call to the world. Um, I knew well over, you know, 70 survivors personally in my own life just from being vocal about my own experience. And I was like, okay, th there's a lot of us. We, ha we have a monopoly of voices. Like, let's, let's use it. Um, and so I pitched this idea to them, and this is the vision that I created for the Survivor Manifesto. I will read this. This is what I sent as an invitation, and from this piece of, uh, piece of text, they decided whether or not they wanted to participate in submitting work to the Survivor Manifesto. So it reads, we, the survivors, will fight the evil forces of the patriarchy. We will never submit. We are here to make rapists afraid. We are here to expose the harsh realities and truths that our society does not want to face. Rape happens, sexual assault happens, sexual harassment happens every day, all the time, to most of us, to some of us more than once, to some of us again and again. We must not be silent. We will fight for our right to live. We will get louder and louder. No more business as usual. We will fight rape culture in hope of a better world for ourselves and for future generations. We will not live in fear. We recognize the full potential of our power. We will use it however we can to fight the patriarchy. We will rise. We will believe and support all fellow survivors. Why live with our experience alone in silence when we can all scream as one? We will speak out against all injustice. This is a fight for the oppressed, for the marginalized, for the victimized, for the hurt. This is a call to speak out. Our words are our weapons. We will hold our fists accountable. We will eradicate our guilt and our shame. We are not victims. We are the survivors. Pretty powerful statement there that got a lot of submissions for this project. I'm so grateful. Um, this is just a quick description of what the Survivor Manifesto is, what it's working to do. And I just want to highlight a portion of this for what I was, what was the aim of this project. It works to bear witness to the experience, the struggle, survival, the trauma of sexual violence, and the ability to heal. It worked to flip a narrative ascribed to survivors' bodies and minds by our society's plague of rampant rape culture. This project illuminates the strength inherent in surviving trauma and the empowerment within vulnerability and speaking out against such injustice. It's a call for community accountability uh, to hold rapists accountable. It's a call for survivors to heal and to speak out because rape culture will never dismantle itself. The only people that will be doing that, it's gonna be by survivors. It's the, it's the only way. Um, brief example, I opened up, uh, I opened up the survivor manifesto with this, this poem. I'll just include a few submissions here so you can all see, um, acknowledging your survival, you will survive. You know how I know, because I've seen a solitary sunflower growing inside of a dump bursting with life because ancient ruins are still magnificent, no matter how many times they've been pillaged. 
because mosaics exist, art made from a million little broken pieces. I promise you, you will survive. And I'll share with you a few images and some text submissions. I could really do an entire workshop on, on just the Survivor Manifesto, um, but I have just a few to share today. Really powerful images. It was primarily written work in this project, um, but imagery was a part of it too. I did accept visual contributions. Wide awake, can't sleep in the dead of night. Who am I to tell my body that it isn't time to protest? And yeah, these images really, really speak for themselves. And the really cool part about this project is that I asked people to share whatever they wanted about their experiences. Um, I wasn't specific as to, oh, share your, share your trauma, you know? It was, what do you want to share about being a survivor? What do you want to share about any part of your experience, your healing, any, any part of it? And people gave whatever that looked like to them, really gave them the power to participate how they want to. I love this poem. Um, by Marie. No one knew she had a knife when she reached up to slice a neat hole through the paper thin wall of the world they'd built for her, pulled herself through it, let herself fall. She landed lightly and ran racing through tangled grasses over thick roots draped in her way under the beckoning branches. Their voices rang after her, come back, their pleas disappearing into the wind and she thought back, no, so clearly they must have heard it. Was there ever more beauty or power in two letters in one syllable? Her only company was the crash of waves between her ears, the blood pounding through her veins. Is there anything braver than declaring peace on your body and brain when you live in a war zone? And is there anything more precious or less certain than the unknown miles unfolding ahead of you? So this sticker, uh, Make Rape is Afraid, I wanted to include because this was another project that sort of came out of the Survivor Manifesto. Um, I had created this little text image. I used an X-Acto knife to sort of create the text as like a more, a more tangible, engaged, meditative way of creating it. Um, and yeah, I ended up making stickers and, and, and I also made some screen printed patches that people could also buy or like, you know, sew onto a bag or a shirt or a hat or things like that. Um, and it really took off in an interesting way of, I provide this as an example of art, just like taking on a life of its own. I just created this simple, simple sticker with this idea, um, you know, and, and had a description of what it, what it's about, what it stands for. It's really a call for a culture of accountability, a push for a world eradicated of sexual violence. It's a shift of fear away from survivors and placing it on where it belongs, on, on people that cause harm, who, who need to be afraid of consequence, who need to be aware of, account, of being held accountable. And um, this really took on a life of its own because once I put it out there, people just started putting it where they wanted to. Um, it was a super community engaged way of, of spreading a message, of feeling this form of unity. Um, and it's really made its way around. Um, I've seen it outside of the US a few times. That bottom photo is in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Um, <laughs> just very cool to see something take on a life of its own and a message become more widespread. Um, and so we can talk more about, uh, if you have questions about the Survivor Manifesto later, I will be providing access to the Survivor Manifesto as a PDF on my website uh, at the end of the presentation as a resource for folks to use ongoingly if, if they wish to. Um, deconstruction and recreation uh, has been a huge theme in my art. So I'm going to give you folks a few examples of what that looks like. Um, the Kiss Dismantled. This was a piece I made in 2018. Most folks have probably seen this. Gustav Klimt does this, uh, has made this beautiful piece of artwork um, called The Kiss. And it hung above my bed um, for years and uh, was, you know, it's beautiful looking. Um, and 
it started to also envelop this, uh, this sense of like, uh, I thought of an abusive relationship I'd been in throughout that entire time and seeing this image and kind of questioning like, is this love? Is this some abuse? Like the hands around her neck um, and later discovering in art, in art history that Gustav Klimt himself, the artist is known to have been kind of an abusive man. Um, and that really just tipped things for me. And I was like, yeah, I can't have this hanging over my bed anymore. I just can't do that. Um, and one day I was just so done with the abusive relationship I was in. I took the, I took the poster down that I had I grabbed some scissors and I just went to town and I just made something that felt right. I needed to take away what felt wrong about this. Um, and it, you know, it's this, uh, she looks very relaxed now. Um, it does still hang in my bedroom. And now it's a very affirming message of, of like peace and healing for myself. And uh, something that I wanna mention just in terms of the idea of deconstructing and recreating an art, the really profound experience that I feel with this that's so healing for me is this idea of constant recreation, right? Because I feel like we as survivors, often we go through this trauma, this experience that like completely makes us feel robbed of who we were, who we are. Um, personally, I felt like I died after the trauma that happened to me. I literally felt like I had died and this was a really therapeutic way for me to be like, wait a second, like we're constantly, every moment is new. We're constantly being recreated. Our identities aren't fixed. You know, we get to like make what we want out of this. We're not just defined by our trauma. So I think there's something really powerful about engaging it in art in this sort of way that gets to like let you rebuild, you know, rebuild from the pieces. Another example I wanted to include, I've, I've really loved, you know, photography and, and getting involved in using, developing film photographs the last several years. This is, a, a, these are a couple of images that I took um, basically right at the site of one of the places where I was assaulted. Um, and, you know, beautiful images. I don't recall if this was before or after. Um, I was just working there at the time and playing around with my camera and I don't remember, but um, I decided after my, you know, the, the rape that I experienced there um, that I was going to just play around with these images and I overlaid them and just broke out an X-Acto knife uh, at the kitchen table. And uh, I'll go back to that in a sec. I ended up just overlaying started messing around with overlaying some of my poetry and cutting out, cutting in words. I'm a very word focused linguistic person, clearly. Um, but, you know, this really like felt therapeutic for me. Um, and taking something from that experience and like I made something, I made something beautiful out of this. Um, there's something so empowering about that. And, and like this form of reclamation, um, a poem that I had accompanying it. I sit on park benches and think to myself, the world is too pretty to have been raped in a parking lot. The way sunlight paints the world gold, green grass and leaves the color of change. No wonder people do not believe. So I offer that as just another example of what people might use, what they might do with, with engaging in art. Um, these are a couple screen print examples uh, in, in the works here. Um, hard, I kind of, you know, played around with more of the X-Acto knife, creating the text this way feels very, something very tangible about that process and meditative and it feels sharp and edgy and jagged and pointed, kind, kind of like trauma. Um, so that tends to be a theme in how I make words um, in my art. Uh, the image on the right is um, taken from a New York Times newspaper. <laughs> and I just decided I, I loved the image. It really represented to me uh, trauma being silenced, not being heard. And I wanted to play around with that in my art. So I threw it together with some, some of my words. Will you hear me when I say no? And made some patches of this. This is a process photo. For those of you that haven't ever done screen printing, it's like basically just 
uh, it's how t-shirts and things are made. It's, it's just running ink with a squeegee right through a screen. And this is the process of burning the image into the screen. It's coated in emulsion. Um, just a couple examples. And I just wanna offer this as like, we're not gonna do this today. There's definitely not enough time, uh, but this itself could be, uh, you know, it's its own, its own activity or workshop to do with folks. And you can use so many different things to take apart and, and recreate, put something new totally together out of it. You could use personal photographs. Folks could use magazines or old art books, um, online images, articles of clothing, other objects that can be taken apart. Um, scissors, you know, tape, glue, it's an exacto knife, some canvas, some type of paper, but very easy to recreate this and using what you have related to your experience for this. Um, so I just offer that as a, a type of art that people could try. The other form of art that I've really, really engaged with is catharsis. Um, it's so important. <laughs> it's like, at least it's been important for me as someone who's carried around a lot of emotions that you just feel like you're gonna explode sometimes. <laughs> Um, and what we know about trauma is that it lives in the body. Um, and for those of you who've never read the book, The Body Keeps the Score, I have a little permalink here um, by, by Bessel van der Kolk. That is an incredible book about how trauma does live in the body um, for all survivors of trauma. And this is why we need catharsis. We need to move trauma when it's in our body. We can't just sit with it. That's how, you know, that's how you end up having panic attacks. That's how you end up having cancer one day we need to externalize things we need to move this energy we need to keep it keep it going this is healing and so this project that i want to share with you today is called call them out uh part one that i made in 2017 uh this was an interactive art installation um this is by far the most cathartic process project like process and project that um i've ever engaged in um it took place at uh, New Fruit in Portland, Maine in 2017. And essentially it was in like a one room uh, sort of exhibit. And I created a, a room within a room. We hung curtains around this bed and this head frame, this headboard that I had set up and created sort of a miniature room inside of the one large room. And people could go in and out through the curtain um, to engage with this art piece. And on, I asked folks to burn whatever they felt moved to into this headboard um, with this wood burning kit that I offered that's sitting there on the bed and um, gave them full freedom, whatever they wanted to externalize from themselves um, and assured them that this headboard would cease to exist. The part two of this project would be that I would be burning this headboard for a complete, a complete cathartic release of whatever they were sharing. I just wanted to include, here's a couple images of the invitation. Um, and the way that this was set up, I, I shared three formative traumas of my own. I offered that as a sharing um, in my invita invitation for them to share. And these can go, you can go back through and look through these if you wish later. And then here inviting them to share whatever they felt moved to, assuring them the headboard would be burned. Um, and I really had no idea if people would participate in this project or not. I'd never done anything like this. This was like really bold. <laughs> it felt really bold, um, but people did and they engaged and it was beautiful. <laughs> I cried a lot. Um, and I mean, we're not surprised to see this, right? As advocates that, uh, you know, what people burned into this headboard. These are some film photographs that I took afterward pre -bur before burning the headboard. Um, People burning in things like, you know, grandpa, dad, babysitter, you know, all these names. Um, and maybe most striking for me was thank you, solidarity, I owe you. Um, and then realizing after breaking down this exhibit that someone had, had burned, had, had wood burned right into the top of the headboard, I protected the wrong person. And I just, it, it just blew me away as, as the hugest takeaway of this project of like how we survivors and our silence, how it can hurt us, um, how, 
how important it is to speak, to externalize, um, who are we protecting, whether that was a survivor or someone who, you know, defended uh, someone who caused harm, but no matter what, I think that's just a huge takeaway message that I, that was gained from this project. Who are we protecting? The part two of this was um, set fire to them. Part two, I did make a video recording of burning this headboard, which is extremely cathartic. If you've ever burned anything, even just sitting by a fire, even if you're not burning anything, um, there's some catharsis there innately. Um, just some process photos of me documenting. Try, it was a hot summer day, obviously. <laughs> um, and here's an example of just something that like you might want to encourage people to do as a release ritual. It could involve fire, doesn't even have to involve fire. Um, I, I love fire, um, but it could be just tearing up a piece of paper that you write down what you need to release and let go of. It could be as simple as that or it could be having a fire. Um, I like to have grounding objects that are important to me, like stones or things to like kind of help ground me. They make me feel protected when I'm doing something like very vulnerable like this. Um, and just like really concentrating on letting it go, watching things turn to smoke and letting new things in. Um, and I want to invite you all to do a little closing meditation before we open up for some questions. Um, just try and you know get into a comfortable position. Maybe sit with your feet firmly on the ground. Take a deep breath. Get reacquainted with your body. I know like some of my work can be a lot. It can be maybe a little overwhelming even. Um, Scan your body for where there might be any pain, where you might be tense, holding things. Maybe close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Take a deep breath, hold it for a few seconds and release all the air fully. If it helps, put, put one hand over your heart and one, one over your belly to feel your breath coming in, coming out. Just settle into your body and ask yourself what you're feeling. Maybe give a smile to what you notice. I'm just gonna ask a few questions while you breathe in and breathe out. Keep hanging out in your body, embodied. What are you afraid of? What do you still need to heal from? What are you holding on to? What do you need to put down or release? What do you need to let go of? Imagine whatever things or feelings that you're holding on to as a feather in your hand. Hold your palms out, face up, and imagine the feather in your hand, imagine it blowing away, just being carried away in the air. Whatever you're holding on to, just floating away. Feel the weight of what you were carrying in your body. Maybe it shifts. Notice if you feel any lighter. Breathe in and breathe out. With every exhale, you're releasing what you can no longer carry. And with every inhale, you're welcoming in safety and love and trust. You are fortifying to keep going forward 
and to keep showing up for your healing and other people's healing. Thank you for doing this small meditation with me. I, it's an honor to be able to hold space with you all today. Um, and now I just briefly wanna have you folks watch the video of the headboard burning from Set Fire to Them, the project that I had just mentioned. And then we'll open up for some questions and answers. It's a brief video, there's no sound. Maybe continue to just keep meditating as we watch. Really focus on your breath. Just give this a sec. Maybe some technical difficulties here. <laughs> Might need time to buffer. All right, that's what I've got for you folks in the presentation. Um, let's see if I can get to the last slide of just trying to provide you folks with uh, ways to contact me. I've got my website listed here. 
The Survivor Manifesto is a PDF on my website and can be found from clicking on the tab Make Rivers Afraid and the tab Projects. And it's been an honor to speak with you all today. Um, thank you for listening. It's, you know, I always want to find ways to continue to support other survivors. And I just want to encourage everyone to, to keep looking to resources and, and local artists and organizations that already exist in our community. Um, in addition to myself to, to form collaborations and coalitions with as ongoing resources for survivors and, and trying to really build those things as resources that can be used long term. I think I think it's could be really, really amazing for the type of work that that you all do. And I appreciate the work you all do a lot. And uh, I will now stop sharing my screen <laughs> and open up for some questions. I don't know if I should be using the chat or not, or if folks want to like speak. I will, uh, if anyone types in the chat, I can let you know, Gage. But yeah, folks, okay. feel free, free to unmute yourself, type in the chat. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I just want to say thank you. That was amazing and inspiring. And I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing all of that with us. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to do. <laughs> yeah, you're get, definitely getting some more gratitude in the chat. People say super, <laughs> super grateful. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, it's an, it's an honor. Oh, here we got a question from Susan. What might you suggest for survivors who may not be comfortable using sharp, sharp objects for art because of self-harm or other reasons? Mm, I mean, definitely lots of other ways around that. Um, not everybody has to like want to like play with fire and things like me, but um, there's, you know, I would say so many other things that you can like rebuild with or take apart. Um, like I, I think of sculpting that like maybe there's something to be done with with clay or maybe it looks like you know getting acquainted with like a drawing or painting or starting a practice like that maybe something more meditative um and not necessarily sharp objects i mean people could also just be like doing everything by hand it could be like taking this apart just with your hands it doesn't have to involve objects too but that's a really good question good to keep in mind Thanks for that. Um, Wendy also says, thanks so much for sharing. So empowering, love the work we all do. Colleen says, this is such powerful work, such a gift to share with folks. Yeah, I know for myself, I'm kind of just sitting with the gratitude of all of it. There's so many offerings in there. So it's such deep richness. That's, I think we'll be digging into for a while. So that might be where other people are at. Amy says, Absolutely wonderful presentation and is an important reminder as we continue to think through how we offer opportunities for healing with survivors. Thank you, Amy. Cage, uh, I would welcome your reflection on something. I feel like in the times that I've been at centers where we've talked through support group programming, <clears throat> we definitely think about what we categorize as experiential support groups, mm -hmm. right? Um, the things that use like your body and movement and mm -hmm. things that aren't narrative. And I, and I think we sometimes associate that as like a phase two, like I've come, I've named, I've like used narrative to sort of talk about what's happening to me and integrate it in some way. And now I want this other way to move through what's going mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. but I would wonder your reflection on order. Like, is there something about Oof, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about like actually needing movement or art to like get to a place so you then can and like make it a little bit more linear could you tell me what you've observed or what you think about that yeah I definitely can um in my own experience yeah it's a great question um I the order definitely didn't just look like support groups first for me um 
or just speaking and audibly doing things like that. Um, I um, can say in my own experience, like I was in complete denial of what happened to me for a pretty long time. And um, I really gravitated toward movement first, I would say. I started doing, I took on a job where I worked outside 24 seven so that I'd have to like, you know, like every day working outside, getting vitamin D exercising all day long, landscaping. Um, I still do that work because it feels therapeutic to me. Um, but that's what I really started with um, and running and coming up with affirmations and mantras to myself while running. Like literally it would just be over and over again in my head telling myself like my body, like my choice, like, and just really starting to ingrain some of these ideas. Um, doing that in yoga too, definitely having a safe space to do yoga or meditate. Um, and, you know, art, art was sort of something happening slowly on the side. I've always, uh, I externalize things. I have to, to process my emotions or I, I just like combust or don't know what I feel. Um, so writing for me is like the biggest tool, J journaling at all, even if it's not to write a poem or like make, you know, art, that in itself is like, I mean, it kind, you know, it, it, it is, it can be art, um, but definitely externalizing and writing. And then the other, you know, the other forms of art, I, I, I think that the process can look, it can look different, but having body stuff sort of come in later, I, I question that. I feel like people need to be in their bodies to feel, they need to be in their bodies to then like, you know, experience what they're feeling and like, and create to like, then do those other things. So maybe, yeah, I'd encourage some of those things earlier on or in incorporated earlier on. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we got a couple more minutes here. Uh, Jennifer just in the chat and said, as an artist myself, I often, I often need that process to happen to create understanding, clarity, and identification in my mind. Something about the making and working with my hands fosters clarity. And I think you, the way I was able to go to that headboard uh, installation, folks, and it was, uh, it's seared into my mind is the thing I say. <laughs> it's absolutely like, just like, there's a corner in my mind where that <laughs> just lives. Um, and that like, the way it feels <laughs> to like to wood burn I think of that catharsis like moving your uh that wood burning tool through wood you're literally like carving and it's rough and there's something about like doing something in that way that I think is uh, amazing anyways I'm not supposed to be talking that much uh we got some more questions three minutes left anything else coming up This is Jody Kennedy. Hi. And I've just seen you grown so much over the years. I'm still at AMHC. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that it's, this has been amazing and you're amazing. And it shows everybody in different ways that we don't all fit into that box. It can't be this is the agenda for today and this is how it's going to go because people have different needs and those needs can change every day and it, you've shown me so many different ways on how to try to wiggle outside of that box in ways that are healing for others and you just you still amaze me i'm proud of you thank you i definitely appreciate that i think uh we have way too many boxes that we live in so <laughs> Got to try to find ways to operate outside of those. <laughs> Alrighty, I think it's uh, probably time for us to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Cage, for this offering, this presentation. Um, it's recorded, so folks can can watch this again. Um, and if you want to get in touch with Cage. They put their email on there, but also um, if you didn't write that down, you can email me. I'll get you in touch with Cage. Anything else? Oh, 
Someone talking? I think I don't know. Uh, anything you want to leave us with, Gage? I just want to thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the invitation. It's like, you know, so meaningful to still be engaged in this work. And um, I'm very much looking forward to Kelly's presentation as well. I think you all are going to enjoy it a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Cage. All yeah. right. I'm going to stop recording now.